Hello again. I'm uh, Dr. Georges Benjamin, the chair of the uh, quarantine committee, and want to welcome everyone back. I want to also want to thank our committee members for their attendance and and strong support of this study. Um, the disclaimer that we read earlier also applies to this committee. I think the important thing for everyone to remember is that um, this is an open meeting. Um, that the committee is basically assembling materials that will examine and discuss. Um, in an open forum. No one should assume that anything or any questions that are said by committee members represent the views of the committee or the views of the academy uh, as part of this process. Um, this is one of several meetings and, um, you know, the committee, the academies have a very rigorous process of review before anything is, is finalized. Um, so folks should just perceive this as an academic session in which the committee is taking in information. So with that, I think we have a, a wonderful presentation for you um, for um, Howard Markell. Um, Howard is the Distinguished Professor of the History of Medicine and Director of the Center for the History of Medicine at the University of Michigan. He's the author of multiple award-winning books, such as When Germs Travel, Six Major Epidemics That Have Invaded America Since 1900, and The Fears That Have Unleashed. Um, and I don't know, Howard, are you going to update that book? I just did. All right. I just did. All right. And quarantine. Yeah. I'll have to get my, and, and quarantine. Yeah. Uh, East European Jewish immigrants in the New York City epidemics of 1892. So I have to go, I have to remember to get my autographed copies of that from you. Oh, my pleasure, George. Uh, <laughs> and since COVID, of course, he's been very busy um, deploying history lessons to combat disease spread. And we're really lucky to have him with us today. So, um, Howard, it's, it's um, please share your slides, and we we'll look excited to hear what you have to say. What a lovely introduction! Thank you so much, George. George is not. What did I do to my slides? They were right there. Hang on. I'm sorry. I apologize. Now, where is the share part? Hang on. Should be down at the bottom. Here we go. Finally, did it work? Um, we get there. We go. And now I have to find start slideshow. Uh, it's very sad when I'm armed with technology. Okay, so let's go. Did that work? Um, um, click on slide show and then go all the way to the left and click on. It's and then go all the way over to the left, where it says place. Oh, there you go. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks, George. It's, it's really my honor to be here. And um, it's wonderful to see old faces and new faces. This is not a new uh, war. <laughs> um, what's different is that I think we all agree uh, we live now in what might be called the pandemic century. We've already had six major outbreaks. And of course, this particular real pandemic has affected people in ways that we some we predicted in some ways that we could not, especially with the politicization and the democratization of information and, and misinformation. Um, it's funny that this morning, uh, Dr. Citron, I, I really want to congratulate and thank Dr. Citron and his staff at uh, the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine, who are always in the thick of things, but uh, thanks for protecting us. And uh, you know, what, what, one of the lessons I want to impart is that while in Camus' The Plague, Dr. Ryu stepped on a dead rat and then followed a trail to his clinic, pointing out that there was a plague epidemic. In real-time epidemics and pandemics, as we have since learned, uh, early knowledge is not all that great, especially when you're dealing with a virus called novel coronavirus 19. So there was a lot of pickup. There's, we're always a step or two behind the micro, but that's act one, and we have to think about acts two and three and now four and five. The, the reason it was so funny that Marty was talking about internecine robberies, that, that's one of my favorite uh, bad signs of an epidemic or pandemic. Uh, years ago, it was like 2007, I gave a talk on these uh, light motifs, these themes in uh, epidemics and pandemics. They're still there, uh, scapegoating, financial issues, uh, how you understand information, information at that time or how disinformation is spread, the role of the media and so on. But I really wanted to talk about today was one about 
scapegoating. Uh, this is a, a, a cartoon of a humorous magazine in 1892 with a shrouded Asiatic cholera being ushered into what was just the opening of Ellis Island. It opened in 1892. You see a very scared Uncle Sam looking over the wall and what is a Dutch immigrant and an East European Jewish immigrant, they come arm in arm. So this was, you know, these were in newspapers and such. And, you know, it's interesting that when we think of immigration today or migration today, it's still a problem. Why cholera? Why cholera was the great disease of the 19th century? Well, think about the trade, the cargo of human beings. Uh, uh, many of them uh, early in the 19th century still enforced migration in the form of slavery. And then, of course, you had, in air quotes, voluntary migration, such as very impoverished East European Jews who are, who are facing pogroms in the palace settlement or Southern Italian men who were needed to make a living and just couldn't do it in Italy and people from the, what are now called the Balkans who actually Slavics and Poles who populated our factories and, and uh, uh, building trades for, for many years. But you have to remember from 1880 to 1924 when immigration was closed, about a million people were coming year in, year out. Uh, and they're often, even though a lot of those people are our relatives at the time, they were reviled in many ways that sometimes worse, sometimes better, or not better, but different ways than various Asian populations were uh, in the current pandemic. Uh, and of course, when you think about managing this once in a lifetime, I, we're, we're gonna have more epidemics and pandemics, that's not what I mean, but we have to admit, uh, there's a lot of gray hair in this room, and we've been talking about the big one for a long time, 25, 30 years. This is, if it's not the big one, it's the second biggest one. It's, it's right up there. Um, now, I just found this, uh, I knew this forever, but Azazel uh, in uh, ancient Jewish lore was um, uh, uh, basically a scapegoat. And on Yom Kippur, people would uh, take two goats and one would be assigned for the Lord, and one was killed at a, a sacrifice at the temple, but they drove the scapegoat out of their community, and it contained all of the sins and evils that they did. That's really where the scapegoat comes from uh, in Leviticus, which has a lot of quarantine laws and public health laws, by the way. The birth of the quarantine, that took a while, even though people often separated themselves from those who appeared to be ill, long before there was germ theory. Uh, it's really the Black Plague epidemic, the bubonic plague epi pandemic of 1347 to 1348, but it came back in waves throughout those decades. And that's when Venice, which was one of the largest uh, ports in the world from the Silk Road to the Western, Western Europe, they founded the first quarantine station. They called it a Lazaretto, named after Lazarus, who came back from the dead. It's Lazaretto Vecchio Santa Maria di Nazareth Island. And uh, in 1485, in response to a successive wave of plague, they adopted a rule requiring all ships coming into their harbor had to be uh, in detained and kept in, not dry dock, but in the port uh, for a period of 40 years. Quarantinario, quarante giorno, 40 days. And that comes from, I think, we don't really know, but a Hippocratic treatise that divides an acute illness as less than six weeks, that's about 40, 42 days, and a chronic illness as something that lasts longer. So um, within 10 years, it was called trentinaria. And of course, quarantine as a word, we all now it's funny, when, when we started working on this, there's very few of us who knew about quarantine. Now everybody in the world has some experience with it. But to almost every one of those people, depending on where you live, their experience of quarantine is very different from ours or, or somebody else's. And of course, there are different people, people who were uh, from uh, socioeconomic classes that didn't have a lot of money or access to medicine in the United States, for example, were really disproportionately uh, um, uh, plagued by COVID. But in the uh, 19th century, the, a lot of human beings are being transported from one place to the other. Those people are not in good health to begin with. And they're literally warehoused, you know, uh, with little shelves in the steerage part of uh, the ship with uh, no real toilet facilities, basically a trough and, uh, you know, very little clean water or ration. So it was not, not a very helpful way to travel. Very different from what Dr. Citron was describing. And of course, these are the immigrants I was talking about. Uh, trachoma was one of the risks, but, but you have to remember that 
there were a, was a state quarantine island that these ships came into before they ever got to Ellis Island. And it was the New York State quarantine island that looked for the seven quarantinable diseases, uh, cholera, bubonic and pneumonic plague, typhus, typhoid, yellow fever, and, uh, that, and that's seven. And so you, people forget, we always look at uh, Ellis Island, particularly that shot on the left where someone is examining, uh, a uniform health service officer is examining uh, a patient for trachoma, an immigrant for trachoma. The real big action was at the state facility. And that goes a lot to, um, uh, this is very important. Um, the, the fact that and I, I'd love to, I'd love some legal consultation. The fact that public health is baked in to our governance by virtue of the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, it, it reserves states' rights for a number of things. Some of them quite un, un, unpleasant and no longer used, but it also kept public health as a state and local control issue, and that's based on late. 17th, early 18th century concepts of infectious diseases as being caused by the rotting organic material. This is a pre-sewage area, both by those who live there as well as animals, there's horses and cattle and so on, that, the, that these diseases are erupting from the poisons, the miasmatic poisons that they give off. And so the health then, given that construct in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I live would be very different say from Washington, DC. I would argue that's such an antiquated uh, uh, idea and all of our evidence is going not just to local, state, federal, but really international cooperation is that that needs to be unpacked and I'd, I'd love some comments of that. Um, nonetheless, local power back then and still if somebody wants to use it, although it's very problematic when a governor tries to use emergency powers and her such powers are taken away by the legislature, which happened in my state of Michigan. This is Cyrus Edson. He was the commissioner of health in, uh, of New York City in, in 1892, which I want to talk a little bit about because I was doing a, a new edition of Quarantine, as George has mentioned, and I, I had to read it again. And he was the head of the, the city of New York's uh, uh, health department. And when there was a typhus fever epidemic in 1892, in, in January and February of 1892, one ship of very bedraggled East European Jewish immigrants made their way from the shtetl to the Black Sea to uh, Odessa, and then finally to New York um, uh, it, at that time. And they were then so poor, they were uh, given lodging at various cheap boarding houses that were provided by a variety of Jewish charities. And then typhus fever broke out among them and the people they were close to. Typhus fever was not yet really understood. The rickettsial organism was not discovered by Howard Ricketts until 1910. So people were espousing, like Edson, there may be an infectious, might be a miasmatic, we just don't know. But Edson rounded them all up and, and put them on a quarantine island. And when he was in, in, investigated by the United States Senate later that year, he said, I have absolute power in my jurisdiction. I could make City Hall a quarantine hospital if I wanted to. At that time, he really did have that power. And because he lived in an era of epidemics, there was always something almost every year or every season, that type of power was really all he had. There was no real vaccines, there were no antibiotics, there's no antivirals, there's not even uh, IV fluids. Well, take a look at the Lower East Side of New York, and, and, and Marty was mentioning syndemics, and every pandemic, every epidemic has these features, these light motifs, if you will, uh, that add or fuel it. Well, think this is what were the poor areas that I was describing. You can see how uh, people are living on cots, they're crowded together. Some people, they'd be a family, would rent out beds in their parlor during the day to people who work night shifts while that family was out at school or on the job. So, and you can see how, you know, look at shopping is not, it's not exactly going uh, to a, a, a giant a, a supermarket uh, and, and there's no refrigeration or anything like that. Well, after that epidemic of typhus was stamped out, everyone was on high alert. And particularly over the summer of 1892, uh, a brewing uh, pandemic was uh, going on starting in the subcontinent, spreading to East Europe. And by the late summer 
and early fall around late then August 15th, August 20th to certainly September 1st, Hamburg was struck with immigrants who were making their way, probably mostly from Eastern Europe, to the largest seaport in the world. It was bigger even than New York. So it sent off, you know, dozens and dozens of ships packed to stem to stern with cargo, including this human cargo I was describing in less than sanitary means every day. And while there are medical inspection processes, processes in Hamburg, they were pretty laxed. And, you know, the United States Public Health Service is 1892 is really the beginnings of a modern United States Public Health Service. It's still the Marine Hospital Service, but it's, it's really starting in 1892 and then the years after to populate these giant immigration reception centers like Ellis Island, or there was one in Boston, there was one in, in, in San Francisco and LA and so on. But it was primarily immigrants that they were uh, uh, looking at for disease, uh, as opposed to um, first class passengers who got a much milder uh, uh, exam, much more cursory exam. This is the SS Moravia and it sailed into New York Harbor uh, and a few of its steerage passengers were tested positive for cholera. It's also interesting in 1892 that 1888 is when uh, Robert Koch and his team identified the Vibrio cholera as, as the causative organism of, uh, of, of cholera. So that's only four year old data. And in 1892, the city of New York starts the first municipal bacteriology lab that was capable of doing the cultures to prove that this was cholera, uh, Vibrio cholera, which is a really remarkable little, not little, but advance in science. And so then once those cases of cholera came in, it was very similar in a way to when Thomas Eric Duncan uh, came into uh, 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 Dallas with Ebola a few years ago, you know, the bells were rung, the newspapers were sounding, and, and everyone was talking about it and fearful of it. Uh, and this brings up the issue of state and federal rights. So the head officer, the officer of the port, the Marty Citron of 1892 was actually a New York state official. Uh, his name was uh, William Jenkins. And the state, really, the Tammany Hall at that time of the Democratic Party uh, controlled that position. It was a patronage position. Dr. Jenkins uh, was not a member of a, a, any CDC or a EIS. He was actually a city coroner, a different patronage job uh, for New York City before he got this big job. And this was a big job, not only because uh, there was a lot of ships to inspect, but also uh, the health officer was paid a fee uh, for each ship that he inspected. So it was a very lucrative position. And he even had a house for him and his family there. So you can see ships started stacking up because he didn't have the staff. Because in, in lean times, in yo-yo times, as Dr. Citron was describing, you don't fund public health because eh, you don't need that. And so he just had these ships stacking up. Well, that got all the way to Washington. You don't want ships stacking up in the largest port uh, in the United States. It has many of the uh, uh, statecraft ramifications that have come up uh, recently, and also it's just not good business. Um, so Benjamin Harrison, who was about to run uh, a losing re-election campaign, he lost to Grover Cleveland, who he beat only four years earlier. His wife was also dying of tuberculosis. And he had to handle this matter as a Republican president who really did felt that the reach of even then the, the small federal government was, was too large. Um, so he alerted his collector of the port, that was the patronage job that Harris had controlled, to start sending these ships on in. So all of September 1st, this would have been a great visual for CNN. The health officer of the port, William Jenkins, was sending the new steamships coming in to quarantine or to, to dock. And the collector of the port, the federal collector of the port's coming in and then saying, go on in. So ships were going in and out and in and out all day long. Finally, the boss of Tammany Hall, this was uh, William Jenkins' brother-in-law. Uh, his name was Boss Croker. And he said, uh, it's not good business to get in fights with the chief executive of the United States. And so that was just one, but really the, the most comical 
but you can also see how dangerous economically that would be if you were sending ships back and forth as opposed to examining for the very few who were ill. There's the only picture I can find of William Jenkins is down to the left. And, uh, and, the, and this is uh, from a, of, of a Harper's Weekly magazine. So it's a pen etching. Um, he uh, was an interesting man because no matter what he did, he always did it a few steps too late. And then everybody complained about it in the press. And, you know, New York City had about 15 dailies at that time, all of them having six editions per day. So like CNN updates its reports at different hours, so did the, uh, the print media. And of course, there was immigrant newspapers, and they're really wonderful to read. I spent a lot of time reading the Yiddish press for the book Quarantine because uh, it, the, the sophistication with which these uh, immigrant newspapers are writing about the uneven quarantine or the unfair quarantine that was being developed is quite clear. And so what uh, both Jenkins and uh, the president could agree on is that it was most likely to spread among the steerage passengers. That's not all incorrect. Uh, if I showed you a, a schematic of how disgusting the steerage compartment of most steamships were then, you would say, of course, they're going to get gastrointestinal diseases. But of course, you know, who knows if a waiter or a steward was carrying it, and those types of personnel would go to different uh, classes, depending on who the where they were assigned. So it's not inconceivable that a first class passenger could get uh, cholera. And yet there were preferential uh, uh, inspections going on for those who traveled first class compared to those who traveled steerage. And that too is protested. Here's Benjamin Harrison, doesn't look like a very happy man. He wasn't. Um, I, I use this picture this is one of my key ingredients of, of a pandemic, and, and, and Dr. Citron was talking about it. This is the slide I used during um, uh, uh, um, uh, Ebola when the few cases were in Dallas, and you could see the various people talking, uh, 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 some of them no longer employed in the federal government, some of them are, and uh, you could find a, 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 a an internecine robbery, particularly when you look at the American history of epidemics. And as I described, you know, the, uh, the uh, inaccurate or outdated information that um, some facet of the 10th Amendment is ba based on, we always seem to have, and we always seem to repeat these local, state, and federal government wars. It was particularly trying by everyone's admission during the last administration when there was, you know, quite, quite, uh, uh, bluntly, uh, there was uh, uh, you know, a new shocking statement almost every day. It was very hard to get consistency, and I think the American people felt that. I don't know of any pandemic or epidemic that I've studied, and that's a lot, uh, that has been politicized at this level. There's always politics to every public health crisis, but the way the internet has also been used not only to spread good information and, um, and help you know, uh, 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 develop vaccines and all sorts of things. But there's also a heck of a lot of disinformation that has been causing us a great many problems in uh, so some of the responses, the uh, questions people were asking earlier. Um, and so that to me is something that we really do have to think about because they're not funny. <laughs> These are not jokes. People, pe people's lives are involved. This is the SS Normania. And that's one of the ships that had a great many first class passengers and they wanted nothing to do with the quarantine. Um, this was the quarantine station in 1892. And this is where the immigrants are, state, are, are hanging out, washing their clothes. But I found these pictures at the Library of Congress. And this one is a picture where uh, there's, there's actually scenes or descriptions of people at this level defecating on people who are below them, uh, washing their clothes, a definite risk for contracting cholera if you happen to be in a cholera quarantine station. But there are a lot of you know, uh, 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 VIPs on the Normandy, including E.L. Gotkin, who is the editor-in-chief of the nation and the New York Evening Post. So he could type up his own and did dispatches from quarantine. And of course he was not in favor of it. Uh, he said the worst thing about being in quarantine is you can't get a decent beefsteak. Uh, and Lottie Collins was coming from England to America to make her New York uh, debut. No one here uh, 
except for maybe a few of you will know who Lottie Collins was. She was the, 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 the star who introduced the hit song, Tara Ra Boom Die. Uh, if you want the sheet music, I can provide you with that after this talk. Um, so without any real help from the federal government, because there was nothing the federal government could do, and it was very small uh, at, at this time in American history, uh, William Jenkins decided to rent out a huge hotel where he could put the first class people. But he found a place on Fire Island. And if you know uh, the geography of New York Harbor and Hoffman Island, which is right below what is now the, the Marizano Narrows Bridge, and you go all the way to Surf Island, that's like a 45 mile trip by, by, by car or by, you know, by, by, by train. And so it was, as it turned out, owned by a Democratic donor to Tammany Hall. So there was a little patronage there too, but these people did not want to be, not only did the people on the Normania want to be on uh, at the Surf Hotel, but the people who lived in Fire Island, uh, fishermen or oystermen as they were called, they didn't want that ship coming into their backyard. So there was it never really worked. Um, and finally, the first class people were left, were allowed to disembark uh, earlier than the steerage class. And what, well, I'll tell you what ultimately happened, but there were very few cases that got into the city. There were less than there were about 10 cases of cholera that got into New York City proper. This is, it's very hard to say stopping all these ships for this period did this or did that, but they certainly decreased traffic. They certainly decreased traffic. And so that in, in and of itself might, might have been something that helped during that pandemic. Um, but it had, a, you can't really see this, but it had a huge impact on immigration. Uh, as you can see, uh, particularly um, right after um, uh, September of 1892, you can see how much it goes down, almost to 200 after the pandemic. And there's a reason for that. Um, what Harrison did back then before the passage of, of something I'm going to talk about, the National Quarantine Act, he made an executive order where he couldn't detract from what a city or a state ordered for a quarantine, but the federal government could add, and he added 20 days. And that 20 days was part of the thing that slowed down traffic. But it wasn't until the following year in 1893 that they codified this into law and why, why I think 1892 to 1893 is a real watershed in our local and state governance of uh, public health to the beginnings, the nascent federal governance of it, a process that, as we'll talk in future, the other, to, other speakers will show, has never really ended. But in 1893, they passed it, the Congress passed it, and created a national system of quarantine. These were at these immigration stations and major ports, while still permitting state-run quarantines, and it codified standards for medically inspecting immigrant ships and cargoes, uh, which is now in the hands of the United States Public Health Service. By the way, they also started the federalization of most of these state quarantine stations. The one holdout until 1928, guess which one? It was the New York State uh, Quarantine Station. And there was language in the law specified which immigrants were most likely to import disease. So if you were uh, an Eastern European Jewish immigrant, you were thought to bring in high risk for tuberculosis and trachoma. Uh, and for uh, uh, Southern Italian uh, immigrants, you worry about cholera. Well, uh, this wasn't exactly an evidence-based study. Um, it extended to the international powers of the Marine Health Service. It didn't become the Public Health Service in 1912, in that it, pro it provided that all ships headed from foreign ports to the United States had to be issued a bill of health signed by U.S. Council prior to departure. So all these major ports like Naples, Hamburg, Rotterdam had a United States Marine Health Service person assigned to that state, that country's, our council in that country to uh, process this, a very primitive process of what was just being described uh, in the lectures before. And, uh, you know, cholera was, as I recall, as I stated, that was the big fear. And yet, we haven't had any cholera, fortunately, in America in the 20th century, and now in the 21st century, it really does 
uh, behoove us to rethink a lot of our policies and laws. But this was the first time in American history federal law gave the chief executive power to intercede, I added a D there, I'm sorry, and add days to the quarantine period and give federal aid to the states or municipalities most in need and to halt immigration. A power never enforced until, and then I leave it at dot, dot, dot. Um, uh, Dr. Gostin will talk, Professor Gostin will talk about, I'm sure, the, the public health law, law of 1944, uh, largely written by Surgeon General Thomas Perrin, which very specifically gives the presidents the power in a, uh, a contagious crisis. Again, never used. Uh, I think it's high time to start looking at these laws or powers uh, because uh, uh, it, I said until dot, dot, dot. Um, the other thing that I think all of us are concerned about and our and and I I want to both congratulate us for our efforts, but also warn us not to break our arms, patting ourselves on the back. Uh, unfair and unequal is still something. It was particularly predominant in the era I'm talking about. But when you talk about uh, how uh, immigrants who crossed the Mexican border uh, they were were considered COVID threats when they weren't and all sorts of things that, that we know uh, are unfair and unequal. And that I think will be an unending quest because we'll learn as we, if we have to do these policies, if we ever have, I hope we don't, but if we have another pandemic, we learn each time uh, of how we can better uh, do these, these bazookas of public health tools. You know, these are bazookas, they're atomic bombs. They're only gonna be used for something like an easily transmitted respiratory virus that is so stealthy and COVID-19, novel coronavirus 19 certainly fits that bill. But we always have to think about these issues. And that's why it's so important to ask the people in quarantine what that experience was like. And now because so many people have that experience and are recording that in various online versions and so on, I think it's a really exciting time to try to delve uh, into those mindsets. Well, I will, um, stop share at that point. Um, and um, I guess I can take questions, right? Yep. So folks with the uh, Larry, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, well, Howard, I just love what, hearing you and seeing all of those um, images that just uh, remind us that this is an issue that's been around for a long time. I just wanted to pick up on two of the last two things you said, but ask you, you know, to fast, you know, given, you know, given your, your understanding of the history, what does that tell us about our task and, and, and our future? Um, you know, in, you know, and in particular, um, a couple of things, you know, how can we ensure that, uh, that, that our, our decisions about travel and quarantine and screening and all of that um, are science-based. Um, and- As also, much as they can, depending on the chronology. As long as they can, okay. depending upon what we know. The epi curve. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, uh, and, and, and also in an equitable, fair way. Um, and so what, what um, you know, what tools do we have? You know, you mentioned um, legal expansion. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, but also uh, what, you know, this, this whole idea of um, the equitable application of law. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear just a little bit more of your thinking, you know, about what, you know, what do we know from history, particularly recent history in COVID that could teach us how we could structure things to do better next time. Because I think by everyone's account, we've done really poorly. Yeah, uh, well, well, first of all, uh, to discuss law with Professor Lawrence O'Gostin is an achievement because when I started, we both had a lot less gray hair, uh, but there are very, well, so there are very few people in the room <laughs> when we were starting. So I'm honored, you know, um, there are things, well, there are things we can do knowing that we're not a nation that tends to prepare very well. 
Um, look at look at the uh, stockpile of uh, not only of, of medications, antivirals, but also of you know face masks. The national stockpile after two thousand and nine, it was at least forty percent depleted, and yet the Congress did not see fit at any of those successive sessions to replenish it. So this is a problem that is so deeply, as I said, I love that expression, baked in. It's baked into the Constitution. It's, there are and, and I think you're. I, I, I don't know who was saying, you may have been asking this earlier, um, is how are we adapting as we get better information uh, and what, why Act 1 is very different, we hope, than Act 3, okay? In that Act 1, you're, you're muddling to figure out what, what's going on. And so that, I think that is where you'll, the law will never truly be catch up to those situations because microbes are faster. But what has to exist, if we're going to keep people in uh, facilities, um, um, you know, there has to be, whether it's a privatization or a state or but something run, that process has to be there. There has to be comfortable rooms, food. I mean, the mere act of quarantine in 2021, thankfully, is problematic as it is. You should get a warm room with a roof over your head, meals, internet access, uh, you know, not just communication with your family, but people checking up on you. There are all sorts of things that we were being done on when the, the Chinese uh, travelers were coming to uh, the United States before the travel ban. This is about February of, of 20. Um, but of course, um, it would be very interesting and I had not seen yet the experiences of those people in federal quarantine. But I don't mean to minimize the use of quarantine. You know, it's, when I came to the study of it, I came to the study of quarantine as an AIDS doctor. And so I saw it through the lens exclusively then when I wrote this book, Quarantine 1990. Well, it took me seven years to write about nine months that happened in history. So go figure. But it was 1997, I think the book came out. But I was still uh, being uh, driven, if you will, inspired by my HIV patients, many of whom were stigmatized for so many issues beyond the actual infection. Um, after the work I did with Marty Citron on the 1918 flu, I came to it with a jaundiced eye of looking at quarantine, but no one had ever done a study, as you were saying, an evidence-based kind of study to see like, are there actual uh, less, are there less cases? Can you, does it follow something? And so that, and then several others that have in its wake, particularly current studies have shown that social distancing, whether it's called a non-pharmaceutical intervention or a, a, a closure of school or a quarantine, they, 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 they did I, you know, uh, help to save millions of lives. But as I said earlier, that is an atomic bomb of a public health tool. We prefer to use different methods. So that's exactly where we now, I think, Larry, are in a golden opportunity before the amnesia sets in to think about like these level one, two, three, four, and five hurricanes, if you will. We know what we're going to do with the hurricane, and we can, we're going to be um, dissecting that for years. I think that's the pandemic all of us will be studying, particularly about those questions. But I think we also have to plan going forward. And I, I was struck by uh, what you were saying uh, earlier is that around 2009, uh, it, uh, in the wake of the uh, 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 H1N1 flu pandemic, there was a lot of talk among congressmen or women too um, about some kind of rent moratorium, some kind of stipend uh, that would protect people who not only didn't make a great deal of money, but were in at show jobs. Like you got to show up to get paid. You're a cashier. You're a baker. Whatever. That that never happened. And this is this is why I think we have to keep banging on this. The task is Sisyphean. People are going to forget about this. I, I fear very quickly after we re-enter our society. Um, and uh, don't let a good crisis go to waste. I used to hate that phrase, Ugh. but I think that's our challenge now. And how great is this that we're discussing it in this forum? So let's start. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen and then Michelle. Yeah, Howard, thank you for a wonderful presentation.
Um, a, a couple of questions for you. You've largely focused on the quarantine authorities as they related to people coming into the country. But the quarantine division also has some responsibility for interstate uh, quarantine. Yes. Um, is there is there a history of that being used way back when? That's kind of question number one. And then question number two is that we've seen some creative use of of, of quarantine regulatory authorities, especially around the eviction uh, issue. Um, and I know that Marty had mentioned that he thought that that was there was some data that what that was effective. Is there any history of something like that being used previously in the United States? A rent moratorium? N not a rent moratorium, but an eviction moratorium. No, because, and that's progress. First of all, if you're looking at epidemics, when I look at them, and uh, really before antibiotics, the whole, this is where I go into the quarantine depends on who you are, who, where, where you are and who you are. But the whole notion of a quarantine would show well after the, the World War II was that you're sick. I don't have a treatment for you. Stay far away from me on this island. Okay, so it was really more about protecting us, not about them. And that's why there were so many egregious human rights violations and medical ethics violations on those particular islands. Now we have a new enterprise where we have modern medicine. Uh, we uh, have you know, the, 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 the speed with which both a, a, a pallet of mRNA vaccines were developed, but also now the antivirals by Merck and uh, so on, as well as you know intensive care and so on, and other modern advents of, of healthcare. Uh, once doctors and nurses got a hold of what they were treating, they got a lot better at it, you know. But none of that existed until well after uh, antibiotics, so it's a relatively new problem. And then if you look at the history of America, thank goodness, until rel recently, we have not had a dire public health emergency of this magnitude. In fact, that has harmed us because many people can't remember or didn't have any experience or even their parents or grandparents don't have experience with an epidemic. And so people are more focusing on the risk in air quotes of these vaccines than the real, very real risk of contracting uh, COVID, and if you're unvaccinated, dying of it. So um, it's a lack of experience, I think, of our cohort uh, that has also um, fanned, uh, fueled the flames of, of disinformation, which is part of a, any pandemic, but it's just so widely spread right now. But I think it's a really creative use of public health. And I, I applaud it because if you can't live in your you know, if you're not housed, that's a definite health risk. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, Howard, thank you very much. Um, it was a great presentation. But can I ask you what's the US history of global cooperation, um, either the sharing of information or vaccines, vaccine technology, quarantine procedures? Um, I know we have a global health security agenda, but it's relatively weak in helping other countries. But um, can you give us a history of that? Sure. And then a second quick question, it's my obsession, is how would you harmonize federal and state government quarantine procedures? Well, let's, let's save that. We know how to disharmonize it, that's for sure. Yes. Um, okay, now the first question was... Um, global cooperation. Okay, so, I have a, I wrote a paper on that in the journal of AMA years ago. Um, and if you remind me by email, I'll look up the, the uh, citation. But there was international uh, cooperation. They were, they were called international, international sanitary conventions. Mm -hmm. Started in the 1850s, long before uh, germ theory is accepted. Don't forget, it's not until 1876 that Koch demonstrates anthrax, bacillus anthrax as, as the cause of anthrax. And then he does TB and Koch's postulates come out uh, in, the, in about 1880 and Pasteur's work is then too, but it wasn't like germ theory was accepted by everybody overnight. So a lot of these sanitary conventions, you'll see a whole polyglot of etiologies, the miasmatists, the zoonotics and so on, but they all agree that shipping of cargo and humans needs to be inspected. It's interesting that a lot of the cargo that was going from Europe back to America 
were rags, cotton and wool rags. And those were uh, recycled, if you will, into new fabric or rope or all sorts of products. And there was a lot of fear that these rags carried fomites because they were coming from the Middle East or rugs, by the way, were another fomite. This is also an era where they're still disinfecting mail. This goes on to the 1920s and mail is put into a steam room with sulfur, uh, which has no uh, you know, real effect other than to smell up the joint. Later on, by the way, the public health service used uh, um, hydrogen cyanide to kill the vermin in ships. Uh, you may know that, uh, recognize it as Zyklon B. And they had stowaways who actually were, were hidden and died because of that. But these sanitary conventions occurred every 10 years or so. And they were all about, you know, maritime agreements and corn. But the, what's fascinating is they didn't understand the science behind it, but they did understand that those germs travel. So there's a lot of, and those go on well, well until about World War I, then they stop. And then there's the League of Nations, which is going to begin the first uh, iteration of the WHO. But of course, our United States Senate did not uh, ratify that. And then after 1948, uh, not surprisingly, Surgeon General Perrin is also on that UN committee. The WHO was created uh, in 1949. Uh, or was it 48 or 49? But anyway, you get to the point exactly, it's not a police organization and has no powers other than to advise, but the, just like the feds have to be invited into a local or state epidemic, unless it's interstate commerce, um, so too the, the, does WHO have to be invited. And as we all recall back in January, February, when both the CDC, our CDC and the WHO offered China uh, experts to come in, they were rebuffed. Uh, so there's, you know, talk about harmony or disharmony. It's on so many levels. I don't know where to begin. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But then there's, uh, I can imagine if we, we started a global health agency with real bite, the, those are against it. You know, they're selling away our sovereignty. You know, we're losing, we're not America, you know, all this kind of stuff. And who knows what other people might say in other countries. It's not so easily done. A lot of people have had that idea. But um, I, I, I think we both, well, the tripod of issues. A, we have to unpack what the 10th Amendment means going forward, well, you know, in this country. And then we have to create and abide by a system that does have a chain of command because it is the fog of war and that's how mistakes get made. And um, it has to be based on the latest science and it will evolve as we go forward because doctors do that all the time. You know, I explain it like if I, if I saw you in the morning and you were, pale, you were look great, I'd say you're doing well. And then if I saw you in the afternoon and you were pale and your, your pulse was thready and you weren't responding, I wouldn't say, well, you know, Michelle's doing great in the morning. I'll just walk on. I would get you a blood transfusion. That doesn't mean I'm waffling in my diagnosis. It means I have new information. And public health I, is the doctor-patient relationship writ large. And we have to remember that. I mean, the whole stuff about face masks, for example, and Dr. Fauci was saying, well, it's not a good what, the idea. Well, based at that moment, we didn't really know. And then he said, well, it probably is a good idea. That is a good change of a practice with new information. And yet, he was not only ridiculed, he was lambasted for it by Senator Rand Paul when he had to testify. Not good for harmony. <laughs> so it exists in so many levels, you know, and turf issues exist in so many levels. Um, I'm glad I'm a historian because uh, I'm not comfortable with the future by definition. I don't have a good answer for it. Marty. Thanks. Thanks as always, Howard. Uh, delight listening to you. I wonder if you can comment, you know, there are times where some of the authorities were in different departments and agencies yes. of the executive, right? A lot yeah. of quarantine, as you alluded to, evolved and the tension between open and free commerce and the risk that commerce becomes the vector of, of disease right. spread. One, one of the challenges at CDC is one of the very few places 
uh, at EGMQ is one of the very few places within the entire agency that has public health authorities at, at the federal level yeah. is, um, is, is scaling that. I mean, it's unlike FDA and unlike CMS and other places in HHS where federal authorities are uh, broader and certainly unlike other departments and agencies with some very comfortable regulatory entire infrastructures around regulatory <laughs> drafting, enforcement um, or, or implementation and then enforcement to challenge, et cetera. What, is, what lessons are there, if any, from history about how and whether public health authorities at the federal level should be um, tied into or, or necessitate interdigitation or handoffs? One of the things we face with the eviction moratorium is when Congress didn't renew, it was seen that there was no other place but CDC to go to with the eviction moratorium. The question really came up broadly is, um, you know, should we should we do it? As I've been known to say many times to my, to my group, you know, the question of what may we do, what can we do, and what we should should we do often follows in that order. And in fact, from a public health perspective, it needs to be reversed. We need to ask the question, what should we be doing first, and then say where, you know, is it is do we have the capacity to do? It? If not, where do we get it? And is it uh, do we have the authority to do it? If not. How do we how do we frame that? Um, that happened a lot in the case of the eviction moratorium. It was clear that um, creating homelessness was one a barrier to implementing stay home when you're sick, but also a risk of you know distributing the most vulnerable groups out to being exposed, transmitting higher rates of, of morbidity and mortality. And the rationale was people that need to move, people that are homeless are often going to move across state lines, that was sort of the catch into the framing. But what, what other authorities have you seen in the history um, with different departments of agencies that would nicely interdigitate or fortify public health authorities so there's more uniformity in the sort of collective level of the response? Or are there no such examples in that way in which well, they're, they're mutually reinforcing? You know, between the period you you described in your lecture, Marty, and the history I'm describing, and I'll, I'll get to a little bit more in a minute, um, says the exact reverse. So um, the first time there was a national approach was 1878, and a national health service was begun by a doctor named Woodward. He was Surgeon General of the Army. It was in response to the yellow fever epidemic of that year, which fanned all the way from New Orleans up as high as Minnesota and Michigan, and of course, the Eastern Seaboard. But because of congressional issues and powers and states, it was disbanded within a few years. The Marine Hospital Service was both to serve the ports of call, but also to um, uh, protect uh, merchant marines and other sailors, not um, like U.S. Navy sailors, but, you know, commercial sailors to take care of those people. And that was a hospital service initially. And then it became like a piece of silly putty bent and stretched in all different ways, especially as the late 19th century and early 20th century progressed, because there's no CDC, of course, then there's no real NIH then. So initially, um, um, the United States Public Health Service is about 100 people, and they're, they're basically uh, stationed primarily at uh, immigration stations, also Native American uh, reservations, and the, the, the social differences there are a, a real, worthy of a real study, by the way. And then sometimes in Washington, working at, you know, the, what, what's the primordial laboratories of the National Institutes of Health. Um, but there's real no federal attempt, you know, there's always just a little bit of nudging. I talked about the 1890s. Uh, people talk about how President Wilson didn't do anything during the 1918 pandemic, but don't forget he was gone. He was out of the country from uh, December, early, late November of that year, all the way through April. He was in Paris doing the Paris Treaty Talks. Uh, he actually caught influenza there. Uh, but the president had no power to do anything uh, in the federal government of 1918. That was, and and then you know all the work that that Marty and I did and our teams together 
was based on really solid, you know, based on reports that were offered by municipalities and states. Um, and so this is this is the one. That's why I keep saying this is the one. I say it is clearly shown that the system is broken. That you internecine robberies versus Michelle's term harmony. It, it's not either or. It's really a continuum. But we must work constantly to uh, keep those at a minimum, um, particularly in the last administration where the pot was stirred every day. Uh, you know, and, 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 and the level of politicization, for, for example, with people going on cable telling them not to get vaccinated, even though those individuals may well have been vaccinated. This is a very different time. And that's why I keep saying this, and I'll say it again, it's like no pandemic I've ever studied. That's why it's so important to study it, even though we're always studying the wrong pandemic when we're faced with a new one. But there, all, of these, all of these issues are there. And now we have to start unpacking them. Yeah, one, one quick follow up. To, this is in regard to Larry's uh, comments about in your last in your slide, your warning slide about unfair, unequal. And we certainly saw a lot of the inequity in, in, in this pandemic in terms of disproportionate effect. Most of the quarantine language, the legal language at the federal level, for sure, and likely at many state and local levels, is designed around as you said, as you called it, protecting the other. We've got nothing, so we need to protect the receiving communities to stay cold and that there's not introduction from the hot communities. But it's, um, there's not enough you know, sort of rationale in some of that language to justify the things that need to be done to protect the communities that are at greatest vulnerability. Yeah. And I wonder if you or Larry had any comments on whether a relook at the regulations, the, the, the statutes and regulations that would enable the synchrony or harmony, at least at that level, that the rationale um, that can be used is not just about whether there's a risk uh, to importation and spread, but whether there's a risk for disproportionate impact and spread to justify the various use of, of sort of public health control. I, I think it would be a very forward thinking idea to create a pandemic trust fund where monies would be set aside and could bear interest over time, but would be there for those Americans, in this case, who were um, underserved and, and at greater risk. As you were talking, I, I had a real smart alecky answer of why um, nations cared more about themselves than incoming. And think about the term globalism or global health, uh, you know, how we teach health today and uh, how we're so interconnected. But in the 1890s and well into the, you know, 1944, we're still fighting World War II. It's all about nationalism. It's all about sovereignty. And it's all about even moral superiority. You know, if, if you're an American, you had great moral superiority over your enemies, for example. Um, so it's not surprising to me that that is that that's. I think you were saying earlier, and we, or maybe we were talking about it earlier. You know, we see what we want to see, or we see what we're trained to see. We see the paradigms that we're used to, or we think are there, even though they may not be. We get we get stale, and I, I, that's why I think this pandemic has so much to offer uh, because there's a, 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 there were things that were not done pitch perfect, absolutely. But overall, you know, it's an A minus to an A. I mean, when you consider uh, what's been going on and the, the mere amount. But I think, uh, I think some type of a fund to prepare for this, great idea. You know, I, I just jump in here, Marty, because you, you addressed it to me as well. You know, I think you've, you're really on to something here. Um, you know, I do support uh, Howard's fund, um, but there also might be some language that could be included in the regulations or even a new statute um, that talked about um, equity in some, some form and, and scientific rationale. The, the, um, and, and there's some good, um, there's a good, good, some good precedent for this because although it's, this issue has never quite got to the Supreme Court, although it has in civil commitment for the mentally ill, 
Um, but there are some federal courts, even with uh, infectious disease quarantines that have talked about the constitutional requirement of kind of safe, habitable, humane conditions. And so I think, you know, we might be able to develop something that would have some, you know, legal heft behind it. But also, I think the fund is a really, you know, good idea. It might, some kind of a fund like that might even be uh, as part of a, you know, a, 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 um, a standing contingency fund for CDC right. and Marty, right. that right. you know, so that he wouldn't, we wouldn't have to keep going. Right. Back it's literally you open the drawer and you take it out when you need it. You just yeah. don't open that drawer very often. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Let's start it, Larry. We could become hedge funders. And <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions? Right. I should add, I, neither Larry nor I want to become hedge funders. I don't, it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Howard, let me thank you very much. Um, that was a very, very helpful conversation. I think it was perspective around quarantine. I think that was very important. Pleasure. So with that, um, I think that we're going to go back into another closed session um, and we'll be adjourning our open session for the day. Um, let everyone know that the next open session will be 11 o'clock um, on November 15th, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, um, where we'll hear some more from the uh, CDC's Division on Global Migration and Quarantine. And uh, Howard, um, we'll let you go, but I, I wanna thank you very much again. All right, and, and Andy, you can close the session. Hey, we're off the air. Yeah, Al, thank you. Thank you. And we'll stop recording. Yeah, stop the broadcast and stop the recording.